Welcome to the Point of No Return podcast, a show at the intersection of technology and strategy. On this show, we interview industry leaders and experts to better understand how they think about strategy during this time of exponential progress. Hey guys, welcome to episode 34 of the Point of No Return podcast. I'm your host, Nectar. On this week's show, I had a live conversation with Ben Mattis, VP Product Management at Intellisports. Uh, it was a real pleasure to talk to Ben. I'm happy that my partner Martin introduced me to him. We had a great conversation about his career and his new startup and how he's looking to bring measurement to real-world sports. Uh, ben has a very interesting background. He started off in the gaming world, went really deep. He's still, he's still a strong gamer. Uh, we, we spoke about why he decided to leave that space and join the consumer tech uh, industry. Uh, we spoke about a, a startup in Telesports, how they're looking to bridge the gap between our digital lives and the real world, which is really interesting. Uh, their business model, we went deep into the different options that they've been exploring. Uh, and then we finished off with a really interesting conversation on where he thinks consumer technology is heading. I really love that that part of the, the conversation. Ben's a really smart guy. I'm lucky to have met him. Uh, we had a great chat about a startup uh, that has a mission that anyone can relate to, getting kids to be more active and play more sports. Uh, I really hope that you enjoy the chat. Ben, thanks for being on the show. Yeah, pleasure to be here. Yeah, happy that we're able to connect, man. And uh, yeah, we're just chatting about your new startup. But before talking about your your uh, your startup that's kind of in stealth mode, yeah, maybe talk about a little bit about your background. And uh... Sure, yeah, before I jump into the whole IntelliSport stuff. Um, well, uh, I spent close to 15 years in uh, video game development, <clears throat> um, usually, mostly as a sort of producer type. Um, a producer in video games has some stuff in common with kind of product management uh, in, in whatever, in the product space. Um, but generally speaking, much more people management as well. So some of these projects that I was working on had two, three hundred people um, who would report sort of up into me. So I'm kind of like the head, I guess, in some ways of this relatively large organization whose job it is to create a video game, right? And some of these games now have budgets mm -hmm. of 50, 60, 70, 80 wow. million dollars. Are you yourself a gamer or? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, I grew up always playing video okay. games, really wanted to be in game development. Um, actually started out initially as a programmer, was really bad at that. <laughs> went into sort of third-party project management, was a little bit better at that. Went into first-party project or product management and producer work, was a little bit better at that. And so kind of stayed at that yeah. for a while and, and worked at various companies and that sort yeah. of thing. And over the years, I worked in uh, mobile, um, like pre-iPhone, pre-smartphone days. I worked at a company called Airborne Entertainment and then at a company called Gameloft, making games for cell phones back when cell phones basically had almost no graphical capabilities. It's brief so smartphone, right? Yeah, yeah, like literally web pages, mm -hmm. making video games with WAP <clears throat> was my first introduction to game development. That was a long time ago. Um, <coughs> and then I moved to uh, Ubisoft, and I spent uh, five years and change working at Ubisoft on primarily the Prince of Persia franchise. I did a little bit of work in the Assassin's Creed franchise as a sort of support role, working with uh, Jade Raymond and Yanis Malat and, and various uh, people in the gaming industry on in that respect. Um, I left uh, Ubisoft, I went to Warner Brothers, spent five years at Warner Brothers um, in the Batman franchise, produced uh, Batman Arkham Origins, which was one of the big Batman games to come out in the last few years. Yeah, it was um, like a big hit, right? I'm not a gamer, so like outside of playing like any channel sure. like, once in a while. Yeah, I mean, all of those games were relatively big. None of them were the biggest, okay. right? I've, I've never worked on the biggest game of the whatever. Okay. Um, so I've always sort of been working... But that's still pretty big, right? Like oh, yeah. I mean, no, in, absolutely. I mean, Arkham, is like hundreds of millions? Or? Yeah. So Arkham Origins was... Uh, I mean, it sold... Uh, I, can only, I don't remember how many copies. Millions of copies. You know, these games have development budgets of 30, 40, 50 million dollars. Uh, the team size is, you know, two, three, four hundred people... Uh, over a few years. I mean, these are big, big projects. And what's your exact responsibility? So as a producer or a senior producer or an executive producer, basically you steer the ship. Okay. I mean, it's very vague, but it de depends on your skill sets what that means, right? Okay. So you have some producers or 
you know, senior producers or whatever, who are highly creative. They're good leaders of people, right? They can rally the troops. They can set a vision. They can get people aligned behind that vision, but they're also highly creative. So they'll be very, very involved in the actual content of the game, what's being made. There'll be other producers who have no idea about the, the creative aspect of it, but are super organized, super detail oriented and really meticulous. And so they'll be very focused more on the kind of project management side of things, the specific scheduling and tasks and all of that sort of stuff. As a producer, you're generally expected to be able to be competent in all of those areas, but different producers have different key strengths, I guess. Uh, but the one thing that's always in common is that as a producer at, at any of these big gaming companies, you're ultimately responsible and, and accountable uh, for the game shipping on time, on budget. And the quality of the product as well. Right? Yeah, so that's where sometimes it's slightly different. You usually have a partner with a title called creative director. And that's usually the person who's defining more the what. Mm. And you're more focused on the how and the when oh, right. you're like COO of making sure that this this actual game that's that's a it. good that's a good analogy yeah okay. that's a good analogy okay. yeah. and again like I said I mean there are some people who combine the two roles into one EA as an example their executive producers are quite creatively involved uh, at Ubisoft there's a couple of executive producers there's a guy right now who's j just shipping a game I, I know named Dan Hay who's an executive producer and creative director at the same time so he sort of does both so mm -hmm. there are some people who combine the two and then there are others who, who, who focus mm -hmm. more just on the operation it sounds side. almost like two skill sets so. it is it really is yeah okay. um, and and you have this 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 behemoth of people reporting into you, right? Just this massive quantity of people. So you're constantly focused on team organization and structure and roles and responsibilities and hierarchies and processes and how is this information flowing and, you know, what are the milestones and did your team deliver on time and what do you do if they didn't deliver on time? And, like, you're really focused on kind of steering the ship and making sure everyone's rowing in the right direction. Um, and so it... it it was a very, let's say, uh, all-encompassing job, right? Yeah. I mean, it really sort of dominated my, my mind space for years and years and years. But in there, there's a lot of stuff that felt like it was a sort of soft skill that was transferable, right? So obviously, you have, as a producer, you've got to have your sort of finger on the, on the pulse, as it were, of what the market wants, Right? Because if your game is a total flop financially, like the critics love it, but consumers don't buy it, that's a failure, right? That's not a successful game. And as a producer, you're you know partially accountable for that, if not entirely accountable for that. So you need to know what the customer wants, right? What's the product that you're building? Um, you've got to have a pretty good sense of prioritization and how, I mean, you've got backlogs of literally thousands sometimes tens of thousands of tasks to do wow. depending on the complexity of yeah. the project right um now generally as a producer you're not at that level of granularity you're going to be a few levels higher but still you've got to be able to prioritize and decide are we going to focus on this or are we going to focus on that are we going to do this or are we going to do that there's an expression that's very common in the video game industry which is killing babies like we've got to kill some babies today people so get all the leads around a table and go all right i know you've worked on that for three months and it's your baby but i'm sorry today we're it's a pretty good expression like basically uh the the analogous expression is like you know uh, sacred cow right? there right. are no sacred cows. there are no sacred cows and we gotta, yours makes more we gotta go kill babies. some babies it's just like yeah it's a bit more to the point that's very to the point and but it puts people in the right mindset right yeah. because very often in game development very much the same in product development, but you will invest time and energy in something and you will have people who are emotionally invested in a particular idea yeah. or a particular feature that they've developed. And whether it because it's taking too long or it's not focus testing well or any number of reasons, the market has pivoted and isn't interested in this feature anymore. Ultimately, it's going to be usually the producer who makes the call to say, okay, you know what? We're not shipping that. We're going to cut that or we're going to deprioritize it. Um, so there was all of these skills that I had spent these years, you know, developing in, in the gaming space. And uh, <clears throat> I 
I had a lot of interest outside of video games. I've always been interested in consumer technology. Mm-hmm. The mobile space particularly has always been really interesting to me. And I found that more and more when I was, you know, had five minutes to kill and I went online to read, I wasn't reading Kotaku. I was reading TechCrunch, right? I wasn't yeah. going to the gaming nerd sites. I was going to the technology nerd sites. Yeah. And so, so was it like a slow burn because you jumped from you know the, the gaming world to the more tech startup? Yeah, world, right. Particularly mobile, which yeah. we'll get to in a sec. Yeah. So was it like just one day you woke up in a cold sweat saying, you know what, I'm looking for a shift, or was it that slow process? Like, hey, this stuff's pretty interesting. Well, I so it it was a slow burn in that I spent probably years growing my interest in mm-hmm. consumer technology. I wouldn't say my interest in video games was waning, but certainly my interest in consumer technology was growing. Um, about a year and a half ago, um, I was, I made up my mind that I was leaving Warner brothers. I, mm. I had left. I, I, I didn't have a job. I was taking some time off to sort of see what I was going to do mm. next. And I did look around at various other gaming opportunities in the city. Um, but I had, I needed to stay in the city, right? Leaving Montreal is not an option. I, I don't want to leave. Mm. Right? This is my home. I, I want to make whatever I do work here. Um, and after a couple of months of that, I didn't really find anything that felt right, I guess. Uh, also, you know, there's only so much opportunity once you're at a certain level in any industry, right? At the executive producer level in the video game industry, at any given time, there might be one job available in the city, mm-hmm. if that, right? So it's not like I had millions of companies that I could apply to. And so the time was right, you know, I, I, it was the right time, the right place to sort of say, okay, let's make the jump into product. Um, and I, I think I, like two days after I made that decision, I got introduced to, uh, Wolfred Dion, the, the founder of Dub Dub, the last company I was at. And after a couple of days, that's how I met Martin, right? Mm-hmm. And after a couple of days there, uh, that's, that's where I was working after a couple of days of talking well, to him. Nice. I, I took that offer and, and spent a year or so there. Nice. So, and, and I've been in the consumer product space nice. since. Well, tell me more about now your new start that's kind of in stealth mode. Yeah. Yeah, your website's very <laughs> opaque as to what it does. But. Yes, yes. IntelliSports. Yeah, sure. I, I, that's why I'm here, right? Um, okay, so IntelliSports is um, our corporate mandate, our mission statement is help athletes uh, of all skill levels have fun while improving, mm-hmm. right? That's why we exist. Um, and the... CEO of the company has a background. He's a physics PhD. Um, his name is Jonathan Guimet. He's uh, got his PhD in physics. He's a very competent hockey player um, and a sort of, you know, just generally interesting guy. And he likes to hack around with various hardware and play around with stuff. And he got it in his head that um, there was this opportunity to combine his loves, right? He obviously loves teaching and growing and nurturing because as a his background as a teacher that's obviously something that means a lot to him he loves sports um and he loves physics right mm-hmm. so the first the very first idea was okay well can we make a smart hockey puck right that was the sort of foundation and then from there has grown this company whose goals are i would say several orders of magnitude larger than that but at the core It's using connected objects, um, whether it be a hockey puck with sensors in it or a baseball with sensors in it or something you strap to your wrist when you're boxing or put on your foot if you're doing MMA or strap to the rock of a curling rock. Like We we, we make the sensors that you embed in the the sports object or the sports object itself, depending Mm -hmm. on the sport. Um, And then that communicates to our software platform, which is mobile only. Um, iOS and Android, um, to take the data from the shot, let's say, use hockey as an example, you take a slap shot and we we collect all the data about that slap shot, we send it to the mobile device and we package it up and we present it to you. So there's like the most obvious, right? How fast was your slap shot? It was whatever, 70 miles an hour. Okay, cool. But where we see a huge opportunity is in what do we do with that data, right? Because just displaying data to users is you hit what's called the we call it the the three use hump right they 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 kick their adidas smart soccer ball and it tells them they kicked it at 22 miles an hour they go okay and they kick it again and it says they kicked it at 24 miles an hour okay 
Now what? Like mm-hmm. how do I, I want to kick it at 30 miles an hour? How do I do that? Well, it doesn't really help you so much there. It's, so that, it's a, like a snapshot of, of the what you did. It's, it's, not, it's not predictive or recommended. Exactly. It's measurement, yeah. right? Whereas we want to talk about improvement. Mm-hmm. So simultaneous to that, we, we, we go out there and we talk to athletes of all skill levels across all sorts of different sports. And we hear these common words that come up, right? And, and this was one of the things that really was big, a big motivator for me. Um, why did you stop playing sport X, right? You go, you talk to your brother, you talk to your sister or a friend, you know, oh, you used to be so into baseball. Why did you stop playing? Or you used to be so into hockey. Why did you stop playing? Or even if you go to a kid who's currently playing right now and you ask them, you know, you're not you're not playing as hard as you once did. You know why is that? We keep on hearing the same words. Right? It's hard. It's work. Yeah. It's too hard. It's boring. Uh, it's too repetitive. Right? right? They're they're complaining about that ceiling that they've hit, where their natural abilities have brought them a certain distance, and they can't break through in order to get that high, that dopamine release that they used to get when they were making improvements in leaps and bounds because they've plateaued. It's natural. Everyone's going to reach a plateau where their natural abilities at a certain point in time stop. That's when the hard work starts, right? That's where the drop-off in sports just peaks. You see thousands of kids just stop at that point in time, Mm -hmm. and they never really advance much more than that. But if you ask the people who do break through that, right, why do you love your sport, right? Oh, well, it's fun. Mm. I, it's fun. I enjoy it. I enjoy the sense of accomplishment. I enjoy that feeling of competitiveness or the, the feeling of community. So you've got two sides. You've got the people for whom sport is work or it has become work and they, they don't like the practice. And you've got the people for whom it's, it's fun and they mm. enjoy it. So we want to make these people who have plateaued and find it hard, get that same sense of fun that the people who haven't plateaued or broken through that plateau have. And that's where, you know, all of my previous experience in game development has some interesting potential and some opportunities because the game development industry is a multi, multi multi-billion dollar industry, right? Whose, Whose entire reason for existing is to, make things fun right that's that's what that it's industry does hooked, it's to get you hooked it's yeah. the it's the compulsion engine of that feeds this multi multi-billion dollar industry um and so as an industry we've gotten really quite good at taking things that might be somewhat mundane or somewhat repetitive or somewhat you know basic i guess in certain instances and making them compelling enough that you want to do it again and again and again and again. And you, and you look at things like eSports, you look at things like Riot, which is a large game developer, and their game League of Legends, which is one of the largest games being played right now. <clears throat> and um, you know they have these eSports tournaments that will attract tens of millions of viewers. Hmm. And they have prize purses now that are as large as major physical sports tournaments, right? So, so here's an industry whose mastery is over helping people break through this sort of mundane. And so our idea and our, our goal is to take some of these elements from gameplay, from gamification, from user-centric design, and adopt these techniques, these patterns, to the process of training for a sport in question mm-hmm. to help people break through that ceiling of, you know, where their skills have plateaued. Yeah, it sounds like an ambitious project because it's not just a, <laughs> a, a technical challenge, but it's also very much a psychological Absolutely, right? yeah. Uh, and we'll get into this model and what, we're, what sport you guys are talking about. Imagine if you're at a, at a younger age, it's not just the sport itself. It's also like the kid's w- own willingness. Exactly, yeah. Um, yeah. So well, that's a really good point. And where do you foresee the initial, let's say, uh, adoption of, of, let's say, if we stick to hockey as a simple sure. one being... <laughs> being in Canada and all, yeah. How do you how do you see initial adoption of your product? Yeah, so I think um, I was talking earlier about those two different angles, right? There's the professional sports teams, and then there's the consumer, right? The professional sports teams they have their motivation, right? They don't need 
Hey, congratulations, you unlocked level four, Shay <laughs> Weber. Yay for you, right? Like, he doesn't need that. Right? I'd love to be on the same scoreboard with Shay Weber. Yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. There's a solution, right? Mm-hmm. Or there is part of our solution, mm-hmm. is by saying to the kid, hey, did, you know, did you know that this platform is used by professional athletes? Whether it's the Shea Webbers or not, you know, is, is sort of beside the point right now. But look at these guys. Look how well they do. Yep. Right? These are, let's say, NHL caliber players who are using this system, who are using our mm-hmm. technology for their own athletic development and injury prevention and you know training regimes and whatnot, but their data is in the system, right? So you can take a slap shot and compare yourself to them and go and brag to your friends and say, mm-hmm. hey, did you know that I'm 32% as fast as this NHL caliber player and last week I was 29% as fast in terms okay. of my slap shot. So there's that sort of social proof, social competitiveness angle mm-hmm. where you've got that that goal, that, that yeah. sort of... Um, you know, mentor or that shining star or someone who you kind of look up to and you want to try and work your way up towards their level of accomplishment. And it's all integrated into the system. So you, yeah. you can see very direct. But who will be the first 100 paying customers? Is it going to be in the NHL teams? Yeah. Or is it going to be, let's say, you know, uh, more junior hockey clubs? Like, how, how do you guys foresee that? So it'll probably be the professional teams first. Okay. Um, that product is, let's say, simpler. Um, it doesn't necessarily have the complexity of that whole gamification platform that we were talking about that has to sit on top of it. It also is a great foundation to see the system with that motivating data. Um, and we are already in talks with you know a decent number of these teams who have you know quite a lot of interest in this platform. So there's a, a, a relatively direct um, pathway between here and, and that adoption. But that's not our real company strategy right? yeah. because when we go back to this idea of helping athletes of all levels improve while having fun those guys have broken through that barrier already yeah. right they're being paid millions of dollars right they're having fun probably hopefully um because they're doing what they love they're being paid well to do it that doesn't mean they don't benefit from our technology mm-hmm. but they're a sort of means to an end it's also it's a capped market, right? At a certain point in time, you're going to hit penetration, market penetration of all of the NHL teams. Mm-hmm. And where do you go from there, right? Okay, you can go to a new sport, but yeah, yeah. we would rather play in this space of consumer technology where there are millions of potential clients than NHL teams where there is, you know. Yeah. As a, as a sidebar, yeah. we'll, get, we'll get to the consumer piece, but do you ever foresee <laughs> your products being used in actual games themselves, like for, for tracking and... Absolutely, depending on the sport, Um, you know, getting used in a competitive environment has a series of hurdles that have to be passed through. Um, Obviously, the the, the players have to want it, the teams have to want it, the leagues have to want it, the governing bodies have to want it. So there's like multiple layers that you have to get to. Um, If we take like NHL again as an example, right, one of the barriers to being used in a professional NHL game is that the NHL, the league, currently has uh, these, these, these mandates about what their pucks, how, how, how a puck, what conditions a puck has to meet in order to be an officially sanctioned yeah. puck, right? And most of those conditions are fine. We wouldn't have any problems with them. One of those conditions is that it has to be baked to a, it has to be able to be baked to a level of like 750 degrees or something. Oh, really? Yeah. Why? Because I don't know. Because they just decided that that's one of their rules. Well, with the electronics currently inside the puck, you put that thing in an oven, it's going to fry. So, (laughs) so I mean, right now, today, with our technology platform, we would not be able to put this in an actual competitive level NHL game. That was endorsed by the league for that reason. Just for that reason? Just, just, that, that's, that's the primary reason, right? Well, I mean, there, there may be others in terms of adoption or whatnot, but in terms of technical hurdle, that's the big one, right? Is that we can't fry our technology. And in terms of the consumer piece, um, do you see, like, uh, like how, well, what's a business model, actually? Sure, right. So uh, the business model is, we were talking earlier before we started, you know, subscribing about the sort of intersection of all the different kind of verticals and whatnot that we look at. So... Our business model is is the subscription software as a service model um, because we believe we're bringing consistently recurring value to the user that grows over time. Mm. Um, so the more data we collect on you, the more value we can give back to you, the more data we collect from people 
as a whole. The more interesting comparisons that we can create, the more interesting sort of learnings we can derive from this data in order to push back at you and say, oh, you know, did you know that you're in the top 10 percentile for your age group in this city and that, you know, people who are higher than you, you know, have been using the platform for this long or sign up for these other types of courses or, you know, all of that other kinds of information that we would eventually want to be able to push back to the user in order to help them up their game. Um, we also have this training regime, which we think is very interesting um, for athletes of a certain level. Um, one of the things that's a really big deal for us is we're, because of um, some of the, the sort of stakeholders in the company and who's involved, um, we, we subscribe very, very wholeheartedly. Uh, to something called the uh, LTAD, Long-Term Athletic Development Program. <clears throat> so this is the current sort of state-of-the-art uh, training philosophies endorsed by, yeah. you know, Athletics Canada, most major, you know, national sports organizations now subscribe to this sort of philosophy mm -hmm. of athletic development. What was it, LT? LTAD, Long-Term Athletic Development. Okay. And it's really, really specific, and it's relatively sports agnostic. So it'll be things like, in your sport, between the ages of five and six, this is the stuff that you should focus on, right? Don't worry about competitiveness. Don't worry about speed. Don't worry about shot. What you need to worry about is having fun and lacing up your skates and balance or like whatever. Like these are the things that matter. And then all the way up through your age groups, but also through your levels. Yeah. Why don't you guys like, um, um, just to challenge the model? Because I see, uh, I see you guys becoming much more an equipment manufacturer that sells pucks, bats, and like, because the cost of the center is going down over mm -hmm. time, right? Versus I think the subscription piece, I think theoretically is great, but for a wider adoption, it'd be much easier to buy a baseball bat and then it comes with an app that's free. Yep. It's just that it's already, you know, predetermined, but you start selling, you know, millions of bats and hockey sticks, yep. which is, you know, like infinite across the world. Yeah. Right? Have you guys considered just that? Absolutely. And I mean, in some ways... We've explored a variety of different business models. In fact, I think at one point in time, that was the model that we were looking at, right? Was physical product, right? With sort of free software. But I think the way what's changed for us is that the hardware is, it's, it's a commodity. If we could do without hardware, we would, right? Yeah. That's not where our passion is. That's not where the, yeah. the, the, value, the add. value add is, right? Um, and so for us, if, if we can get to the point where it's a sticker that you onto whatever sport object you already have. You yeah. stick it onto your soccer ball or you stick it onto your football. Great. That's where we want to be, right? Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily want to be a, a sports equipment manufacturer. What yeah. we want to be is in the business of creating that platform, that growth platform yeah. that is software oriented, right? Because that's where all the intelligence comes. And that it's hardware dependency, we minimize that as much as possible. Okay. So the specifics of, you know, your point about buying a baseball bat or buying a baseball and then subscribing or whatnot, obviously we're still working on. But, like, the goal is get the hardware into the hands of the consumer at the cheapest possible price. Yeah. Maybe it's at a loss or barely covering costs, but it's not where our profit center is going to be. Yeah. Or the other idea is that you go, you see CCM or you go see Cooper, you, you know, you license your hardware. Yes. And you offer a free app, but then you say, well, here's all the goodies that comes within the free app for mm -hmm. the user. But then if you want, let's say, the, the, the predictive slash recommendation engine, well, that's going to cost you yeah. five bucks a month or yeah. whatever. Yeah. So, so there's definitely that idea of doing, um, let's say, a more... Uh, freemium model, right? Where you get some base level functionality for free and then you can kind of a la carte the stuff that you want to unlock on top mm -hmm. of it. Um, also something that we're looking at, also something that we're considering. Uh, obviously, I'm sure mm -hmm. you've heard this a lot, but you go down that route, you're, getting, you're giving Apple and Google 30%, right? There's yeah. no two ways around it. If you unlock any digital functionality in your app, they get 30% whether you like it or not. Well, there's workarounds in the sense that, I mean, if because I, I know for Apple, for sure, if you offer a subscription on other platforms, because I know, I know I know through some work that we've done on the on the media side, <clears throat> if you're like, well, it's not just mobile app, but let's say there's a desktop platform that benefits from it, mm -hmm. Apple actually permits a workaround where they don't take a cut. 
Only if the sign-up happens on the website, the account transaction happens on the website, and the Apple app doesn't mention or point to it in any way, yeah, shape, or form. Yeah. But that makes it a lot more difficult to do that a la carte sort of microtransaction, right? I, I'm in the app right now. I want to... I'm motivated to unlock this mm -hmm. component of the experience, right? If you want that level of, let's say, um, instantaneous, almost uh, sort of, sort of gut reaction kind of upgrade on the part of the user, right? Where like they're they're suddenly in a position where they feel like they want this component of the app to be unlocked for them. Apple's going to take its cut. Google's yeah. going to take its cut, and it's not a small cut, as you know, right? Thirty yeah. percent. So so it's all stuff that we're looking at, obviously. One benefit of the subscription model um, is that you can do it all on the website, right? And not have the app talk about yeah. account upgrade stuff yeah. whatsoever, right? All it is is just a login flow. Mm -hmm. And all of the account management stuff is done on the website. Yeah. In that kind of situation, Apple's not going to necessarily take it 30% if the app is fully unlocked in terms of functionality. As yeah. soon as you start piecemealing it and and digitally unlocking certain components, yeah. they consider that to be a premium feature and they want their yeah. cut. Cool. I'm going to ask you a few rapid fire questions. Sure. How do you think about strategy right now for IntelliSports? Like, is there a specific like methodology you guys use? You sit down with your CEO and like, how do you, how do you guys, or is it too early stage that there's still a lot of ideas? And... No, I mean, I would say this company more than most is I've been involved in, um, had to be very, very, in my opinion, intelligent about strategy. Um, because let's go back to this hockey example, right? It's exciting, right? Oh, NHL, let's go talk to the Habs, let's go talk to the Leafs, and let's build this game engine and all this sort of stuff. That's a risky play, right? I mean, that's a big market. I mean, it's not as big as, as basketball or football, but hockey is millions and millions of players and, and hundreds of millions of dollars and, and uh, lots of competition uh, in that space, lots of people competing for the eyeballs of, yeah. of consumers. Um, if we had, if we go into that space and we swing and miss, well, you know, as an early stage startup, you don't get that many at bats, right? You don't get that many chances to swing and miss as an early stage startup. I mean, without obviously really deep pockets. Um, so one of the things that we did as a company on the subject of strategy is, okay, where can we define our processes, get our hardware manufacturing in place, iron out our billing subscription model, own a sport, right? Like, I don't want to be the number two or three technology provider in a sport. We want to be the number one. Yeah. Um, like, where can we sort of kill all these birds with one stone um, and still do something that, that that's meaningful and can generate interesting revenue? Yeah. Um, and we found our sport. And we, we, we tell it to people, and sometimes they smile, and sometimes they laugh, and sometimes they just shake their head in disbelief. Mm -hmm. But uh, IntelliSport's first sport um, is, is coming out this fall, and it, it's going to be curling. Because, oh, really interesting. Yeah. There are 1.3 million paying curlers in Canada. Hmm. The Briars Cup, which is sort of like the big curling championships, uh, is the second most watched sporting event on TSN. Um, it's sometimes hard for people in... Quebec to sort of wrap their heads around how big a sport curling is in the rest of the country. But there are close to 300 curling clubs in Ontario, and there's close to 250 of them in Alberta. Um, and they all have between sort of 300 and 1,000 paying members who subscribe to that club on an annual membership are paying sometimes hundreds, sometimes close to $1,000 in annual subscription fees. For a sport that they're super passionate about, right, that they love to do, that has a lot of physics information that they need. How much does the rock rotate? How much is it curling? How fast is it moving? How much did they move the rock? Did they deviate the rock to the left or the right during their delivery? I mean, I've become a curling nerd, so I could talk about all this stuff for ages. But here's all this data that they need to know. There's currently no solution in place in order to give this information to them. And our ambition is to come into this sport, roll out to ring, you know, curling clubs across the country over the course of this fall and, and winter um, so that, you know, by, let's say, Christmas, we've really proven out all of these infrastructure things that we need to solve as an early stage startup. 
um, and are generating revenue and have one sports product under our belt and are ready to leapfrog into <laughs> the second sport and the third sport. And so I guess you kind of mentioned it, but your, your top three priorities right now. I mean, I think for any early stage startup, right, it's, you, you'll probably hear a lot of the same thing. So it's obviously product market fit. It's obviously shipping. It's hitting that MVP. It's getting our first paying subscribers. Uh, it's it's validating our assumptions about the product and the, the platform. I mean, it's 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 going to be the kind of the same things that um, a lot of generic, like any sort of startup in our position would say. I think what's unique for us is that simultaneous to that, we also have to be continuing to speak to the professional sports teams making sure that the platform that we're developing is going to service their needs for, <laughs> for when they want it, right? And again, like I was saying, what what a professional sports league wants or a sports team wants is going to be very different than what an average consumer yeah. wants, right? And at the same time, we need to spend some energy on developing the foundations of that consumer play as well so that in – Spring 2018, if everything goes according to plan, we're releasing our you know baseball product and 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 not just the Toronto Blue Jays, but also little you know Joey down the street can can go to this order online and get a you know a Intelli Sports equipped yeah. baseball and and play with his friends and have all that data and everything. So it's sort of it's your typical you know to market go to market kind of challenges. But at the same time, keeping our eye on the stuff that's just over the horizon. Yeah. Because if this curling rollout goes according to plan, knock on wood, we need to be ready to move very quickly. It's not like we can say, okay, everyone take a deep breath and start over and start back at the beginning. No, it's like months later, we need to have product number yeah. two out there. And is there anything that keeps you up on it? Obviously, outside of like survival and like you know cash, is there anything specific that, uh, that, you, that preoccupies most of your time? Yeah, I mean, again, I, I think a lot of startups are going to say the same thing. We've made assumptions, right? We, we, you challenged me on one of these assumptions earlier, the business model, right? Is Are people going to subscribe? That's a big one, right? Yeah. Are we offering enough value that people are going to say, yeah, I'm willing to pay that as a monthly recurring or as an annual recurring? Uh, that's a big one. If not, what do we do? Do we do we cram more value in there, or do we pivot business models? I mean, that's that's obviously something we spend a lot of time talking about. Um, the one thing that doesn't keep me up at night is the actual technology. Right? It works. The hardware works. We've literally made um, our own little mini uh, skating rink, uh, which we needed to do because there's not a lot of rinks ice time that you can kind of just saunter up to in the middle of the summer in Montreal and just be like, yeah, we're just going to start messing around on your ice and playing with some hardware and stuff. Don't mind us. I mean, we, we needed to have our own. So we literally built a little miniature skating rink, which is currently installed in the um, garage of, of John, the, the CEO. And it's a little compressor and you turn it on and the ice freezes within a few hours and we're, we've got our own little mini skating rink oh, where we're playing with all of our hardware and testing all the devices. And we were just there two days ago. I had my app running and we're throwing curling rocks and getting all the data on the phone in real time and moving the puck around and taking little shots and getting all the data in real time. So it's really exciting to see the technology platform work and know that that sort of is one thing that we don't so much have to worry about. That's one thing that's kind of checked off the list. So I'll just focus on worrying about all this yeah, stuff. That's great. Do you have a, a, a most productive time of the week where you feel that or the day where you feel like you're able to like get more work out? Personally or as a company? Personal. Personally. I am sort of one of those morning people. Like, I definitely find uh, that the before lunch time to be a very productive time. Um, I think, like most people, I hit that sort of three o'clock hump, right? Mm -hmm. Where I need to do something. I got to go and sort of shake it up and walk around a little bit in order to, to, to um, try and uh, get the juices flowing again. But... Um, and I think more and more people are probably in this space, you know, because of mobile technology and I've got almost every tool that we use um, has to be, if not mobile first, at least mobile strong. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in the gaming industry, we used uh, Jira a lot. Um, I loved Jira. I thought it was a great platform. I always thought that their mobile solution was horrible. Uh, Pivotal Tracker, which is a 
Jira Lite kind of thing has a great mobile platform. Um, and so I've been using uh, Pivotal Tracker for the last year and a half because I'll do so much of even just my product management stuff on the Metro on the way here this morning. I was literally writing stories, right? And I was literally assigning tasks on the Metro while I was on the way here. So for me, that sort of typical period of productivity is elongated and stretched and sort of changes in interesting yeah. ways when you allow the flexibility of true mobility into your life. Yeah. And if you have your, your production pipeline set up in the appropriate ways, there's a surprising amount that you can do sort of at all hours. Yeah. My wife doesn't necessarily love it when I'm working at seven o'clock at night, but um, <laughs> yeah, you can get a lot done. That's great. Um, maybe before last question, we respect over your time. Where do you see uh, your industry heading, right? Like connected sensors, software, like yeah, I see costs going down mm -hmm. dramatically over time. Yeah. Curious to see your take on it. Yeah, I mean, this was actually a, a, a pretty validating moment a couple of uh, weeks ago. Um, <clears throat> there's a, a company in the gaming industry named Electronic Arts. Electronic Arts is one of, if not the largest, game development publisher in the world. And uh, it has a CEO, a guy named Andrew Wilson, who's been running it for a few years now. And uh, Andrew Wilson has been doing the tour, uh, doing interviews over the last few months talking about his vision for the future of video games. Um, and sometimes they use the word games to life, or sometimes they use the word your life is becoming a video game. But basically, the, the, the gist of it is that more and more, the barrier between the real world and the digital world is collapsing, right? Whether we look at augmented reality or virtual reality or embedded sensors or IoT or, you know, you name it, more and more, that barrier is going down. So there are more and more opportunities to collect data in the real world and use that to power digital experiences, whether that be video games or entertainment or others, right? So for me, when I look at the future of the industry I'm in right now, I absolutely see the opportunity for those barriers to come down because we're doing it today, right? I mean, now it's not, it's not nothing. We have to physically manufacture objects in order to collect the data. But more and more, um, this vision of the, the, the things you do in the real world powering your digital experiences, I think, is going to become the norm. And, and Andrew Wilson gives this example of, you know, the number of steps you take in a day tracked by your Fitbit sensors or whatever are going to feed into your star character and your FIFA Ultimate team, mm -hmm. right? So now he's got some sort of agility boost because you ran, you know, whatever, three kilometers in the day. And so now he's going to have extra stamina, for example, in the match that you played that night. So that feedback loop of what do I do in the real world, powering my digital experience and my digital experience motivating what I do in the real world is where we are going. Right? Mm -hmm. That as a company is, is exactly what we think is interesting. I want to be motivated to get on the ice and practice my slap shot and practice my skating and practice with my friends to literally get better as a hockey player, to break through that, that ceiling that we talked before. I want that motivation to be helped reinforced by my digital experiences. Mm -hmm. right? I don't want my Facebook time wasting and my hockey playing to be completely separate. If I can somehow use my digital experiences to reinforce and motivate what I do in the real world and then vice versa, I think that's going to create stronger motivations in life to break through some of these more, let's say, challenging activities. Yeah. And that, that's really where we see the future of, of what we're doing. Super fascinating. Super fascinating. But yeah, thanks, thanks for your time today. Yeah, I pleasure. learned a ton. Maybe one last question. Where sure. can people learn more about IntelliSports? I know like you're hiring. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, obviously our website is, uh, is, is pretty basic right now. It was literally just created in order to find a couple of hires, which we've done. Um, stay tuned to that website because it's, it's, it's going to be updated, you know, in the next sort of month or two, uh, with our, our, our product rollout and our, our strategies there. And obviously, you know, anyone who's interested in this idea of connected sports and wants to know more, um, we'd love to get in touch. I mean, whether it be because of partnership opportunities or they want to know how the technology is going to work or anything along those lines, we're, we're pretty open about that sort of stuff. We love talking about it. So really, if there's any of your listeners who found anything that I just said even remotely interesting, then by all means, they should get in touch. Super cool. Super cool. Well, thanks again for that. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. I really had fun. Thank you for listening to the Point of No Return podcast. 
Never miss an episode by clicking on the subscribe button on iTunes or Google Play.